Well, good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to have you all here. I hope you're enjoying your, your Pebble Beach Monterey weekend. It's been fantastic so far between the weather and the cars and, and everything else, but it's really, truly all about the people. And today, um, uh, TDC Risk Management, which is my company, we insure uh, ultra successful people all over the country for their homes, their, their cars, uh, their car collections. We do that primarily through AIG Private Client Group. Uh, between the two of us, we've been able to uh, sponsor these forums for the last two years. And these are the ones we really, really get excited about. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Donald Osborne and this guy named Jay Leno that I, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see just how much risk he can manage right now. <laughs> I'd say fairly unmanageable, uh, the two of us are. Okay, I'm not sure. Now, I have no, Donald's put together something. I have no idea what it is. It's supposed to surprise me. <laughs> so, but can I introduce one person? You certainly can. You know, as you know, our hobby is getting older. We need to get younger people involved. And there's a gentleman here who is probably responsible for more young people being involved in cars than anybody else I can think of in the world. He's a director, a producer. He's the director of the Cars movies, which, of course, have gotten more young people involved in cars. John Lasseter. John, where are you? There's John right there. Yes, there you go. So, uh, and he's been meeting with designers all day yesterday, getting ideas for the Cars films. And, you know, interesting cars that he can, and he, he really takes real cars and adapts them to the movie, and that's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it so much fun. So, John, thank you very much for all you do to, to get young people involved here. Okay, Donald, go ahead. All righty, so off we go. Fuck up, folks. It's time to assess and caress with the blood. If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Get checked, please. Thank you. Apparently, <laughs> this is some sort of eulogy. <laughs> well, the uh, interesting thing, uh, you're here, obviously, for Assess and Caress with Donald Osborne oh, uh, and, and Jay Leno, of course. Yes, yes, yes. yes. He's assess, I'm correct. Exactly. <laughs> and tipping is encouraged. Um, so the, the point of today's uh, presentation, which isn't a presentation actually, it's more of a discussion. I really wanted to have a different setup here. I wanted to have a nice big high back leather uh, wing back chair and a couch. Because I'm going to analyze today Jay Leno as a collector. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what does collecting mean? You know, there are people that have lots of things. Everybody watches, you know, the, the program Hoarders on TV. And um, not that I'm comparing Jay to a hoarder in any way, shape, or form. No, that would be fine, because I, <laughs> I still have clothes from the eighth grade. I do. And they're in my closet. You know. They might come back Hoarding into fashion. Hoarding is okay. At any moment. Um, because one of the things that... Uh, People think that a collection has to have a theme or a focus. Otherwise, it's just accumulating objects. And anybody who has watched Jay Leno's Garage, anyone who has been following Jay Leno's Garage on uh, YouTube, anyone who has had the great blessing to visit the garage, knows that Jay's tastes run a very wide range. So the point is, Ken. Obviously. <laughs> Indeed, sometimes he actually evidences no taste at all. <laughs> Here I am. But um, so I'm going to start with a couple of examples. It's going to be a very loose and relaxed discussion of some of the cars that Jay has. He doesn't know what I'm going to put up here. I went around my last uh, visit to the garage and just took pictures of cars. And I'm going to ask him about what drew him to a particular car, what it is, what drew him to a particular car. I have actually broken the code. And we're going to see at the end of this presentation if I'm correct, which of course if you watch the segment, I'm always right. Um, <laughs> or if uh, Jay has other secrets yet to be known. So first, this is a lovely uh, Duesenberg, one of your many Duesenbergs. What's the story about this car, Jay? It's Model X. That's a Model X Duesenberg. That is the last Duesenberg built by the Duesenberg brothers 
before E.L. Cord bought the company. E.L. Cord bought the company, walked in, said, finish this car, this is it, and now we're going to uh, build the Model J. I want you to build, well, he didn't call it the Model J. He just built the most extravagant, fastest, best, most luxurious American car that you could. Uh, I found this car. A guy bought it named Howard Johnson, who lived six miles from me. He bought it in No 19, relation. No, no it relation. Bought it in 1945, and he drove it from Chicago to Burbank, and it, it had a spun bearing or something. And he locked it in his garage, and the garage was not opened until 2005 when I got the car. And interesting thing, his daughter, who was born in the house, had never even seen the car. He was one of these guys. The garage door was locked. There was an earthquake, and the garage shifted, so you couldn't open the door. So the car was pretty much sealed in there. And I knew there was something in his garage. And every day I'd drive by, you know, maybe I'd go by in a Stanley Steamer, and he would, what's that? You know, and the next I'd go by in a Model T. And, you know, he was, and finally, he just got curious. And although I never got in the garage, on his deathbed, he said, let's show you in the garage. <laughs> you know, okay. Okay. So was, after that, I got to go in the garage, and when we opened, when we finally got the door open. Oh, I found, I mean, all sorts of memorabilia from 1945. There was a six-pack of orange crush soda. Uh, there was uh, a bunch of newspapers, you know, Japanese strike again, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, so it was just, it was a fascinating time capsule. And the car was, was 20 years old when he parked it in his garage. So it was well-worn. But it was too nice to restore. So we just sort of cleaned it up, did the engine, did the brakes, uh, you know, made it roadworthy, but wanted to keep it exactly as it was because it was a sort of an, it's a real gangster looking car. It has a much lower roof than most of the cars of the period. Um, and uh, I can't, is it Holbrook? I can't remember who did the body on this one. Um, but it was just sort of racy looking. And it's, it's, it's a single cam, straight eight. And it's just a fun car to tool around in because the interior and everything is exactly as it was. So I just wanted to preserve it and, and, and drive it occasionally. So. Excellent. That's the story on that one. The next one is rather different. A Fiat that, that's Topolino. A, that's a 1937 Fiat Topolino. In fact, John Lasseter fell in love with this car, and we sent it up to him. And he used it in the Cars movie for the Uncle, Top, uh, Uncle Topolino character. Uh, so that was kind of cool. So it has a little bit of a story. And uh, whenever you see these, they were always made into hot rods by Southern California guys. They made into gassers and everything because yeah. they Gas were so tractors, lightweight. Yeah. It's a fascinating vehicle. It is the most, uh, uh, the best packaging of any car. You can be six feet, seven feet tall and drive this thing. Uh, the headroom in it, people are astounded. It's 13 and a half horsepower. It goes about 55 miles an hour. Um, and that was the first people's car. Volkswagen always gets the credit of being the first people's car. But that didn't come out until after the war. They had 100,000 of these built before the war really even got going in Italy. This is Italy's Model T. Italy's Model T, and it's so beautifully styled. Now look at it. There's no chrome. There's nothing shiny really on the car. And yet, it has a real presence, you know. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, it was designed by, what's his name, Giacomo? Dante Giacosa. Uh, Giacosa, yeah. And uh, the engine is in, the radiator is in back of the engine. I mean, it's just a really unique automobile, rear wheel drive, and, and a lot of fun to drive. A lot of fun to drive. Keep that in mind. There, there will be a pop quiz, by the way, at the end. But uh, just keep these clues in mind if you want to take notes. Fun to drive. Interesting story. Something, again, slightly different. OK, that's a 1906 advanced tractor. <laughs> that thing weighs uh, 13 tons. Um, I, we put rubber on it so you can drive it on the street. Because originally, it just has the metal wheels. It had the metal wheels, which would break up the street. But if you put rubber on it, and since it's a farm implement, I can drive it on the street because I'm, I'm going, You're driving from one I'm field going to, to my next. field. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but that's true. I mean, when the cops would pull me over in this, I would go, it's a farm implement. You know, where's your farm? Uh, uh, up north, you know. <laughs> take, you know. Believe me, five miles an hour in this is hilarious. You need two men to run it. It takes 300 gallons of water to fire it. It is so powerful. This act in a tractor pull, this beat a guy with a, a twin diesel 
turbocharged and supercharged. Uh, this actually pulled it backwards. It's one cylinder, <laughs> and though it's only it's only uh, it's only 16 horsepower, I mean they're Clydesdales. They're yeah. huge horses. I mean it's amazing how powerful this thing is, and it's six miles an hour. You just scare yourself to death. <laughs> it, 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 it rattles and bangs, and it, and we run it on propane, so we're not polluting. It's not running on coal or anything like that. But it's a fascinating piece of Americana. Uh, the guy who had it buried it during the war. He buried the whole tractor because they were looking for these things to melt down, you know, to make battleships and whatnot. So I don't know how he got it out of the hole, but <laughs> um, that's what he did. And I, he, and then it came out to Victorville, California. That's where I got it. But it's fascinating. Were you looking for an advanced tractor? Or was it just something? I was looking for a, a big steam engine. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the English do this wonderfully well. They have these these show tractors and these. You know, they just they call them showmans, and they're you know they're just fantastic. The road locomotives they mm -hmm. call them too, and and that's sort of what this is. But believe me, when you're in traffic and this thing is coming behind you, I mean, people just. Get out of the way. It, 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 it's fascinating. And you got three whistles on it that are ear piercing. And it, it literally, it stomps down the road. Kung, 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 kung. I mean, you know, maybe five, six miles an hour is as fast as it goes. But it's frightening at six miles an hour because you have to go like this to stop it. And it essentially has no brakes. You have to reverse the engine to stop. So it's, and then it's, it's like, like stopping yeah. an ocean liner. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. But it's, Again, a lot of fun to drive, a lot of work to drive. But, and but if cool. this at uh, six miles per hour is terrifying, something very different at a very vast rate of knots, 132 miles per hour this vehicle will do? Uh, yeah, that was Howard Hughes's uh, Doble steam car. If you never heard of Abner Doble, he was uh, interesting. His grandfather invented the Pelton water wheel. If you go to, we were just up at... Uh, William Mulholland's first plant in 1917 to generate electricity for Los Angeles, because Los Angeles is growing so quickly. Uh, when you go into that sort of, it's not Art Deco, it's 1917, but it looks that sort of Art Deco. The original plant is using all the original equipment from 1917 to make electricity to this day. Exactly the same. Nothing's been changed. Not computerized, not updated. It's making electricity exactly the same way. Water comes down, hits the wheel, big giant generator, and it says Doble on all the equipment. So Doble supplied that equipment. And, and his, his uh, grandson, Abner Doble, decided to build the Doble steam car. And to this day, nobody's built a better steam car. It's the only steam car where you turn a key and you go within 30 seconds. Most steam cars, you have to light a match and heat water and do all kinds of stuff. Go back in, have breakfast. Yeah, yeah. This, this does it all automatically. And it's a fascinating piece of uh, Americana. He only built 40 cars, and like Preston Tucker and like a lot of these guys, uh, each one was different. He would build one, investors would come in, and he'd go, mm, I want to do the next one this way. And then finally they just got frustrated with him. Plus, by this time, the self-starter had come along, so there was no need for real steam automobile. The advantage of it is there's no transmission. It's dead silent. You get 1,000 foot-pounds of torque from rest. And you can cruise down the freeway 70, 80 miles an hour. The only trouble is you need three fuels, oil, water, and gasoline, or With kerosene to heat. But uh, again, it's just fascinating because it's, it's a complete absence of noise. It just, shh, just sort of goes down the road. I always call it the hand of God when you open the <laughs> throttle because the torque just pushes you. You have a four-cylinder compound engine. And unlike an internal combustion engine where you go one, two, three, four, bang, one, two, three, four, bang, one, a steam engine, steam pushes the piston up, steam pushes the piston down. So you have the same power impulses as a 16-cylinder engine. That's what gives you 1,000 foot-pounds of torque from zero. So you just open the throttle a crack, and the thing leaps forward. This is the only car that Howard Hughes has that was faster than his Duesenberg because there's no transmission. You just open the throttle. It just keeps pulling. You don't have to stop, double clutch, shift. You know, so that's what makes it fun Do you to drive. Think fun to drive. <laughs> Not that that may be a clue of any sort, uh, but do you think uh, the, the, the fuel... No, go ahead. This, this, is, this is always the point, which usually is lost on the uh, editing room floor, where Jay thinks, I absolutely have this. I absolutely have this. What do you mean I'm wrong? Um, but that's okay. Um, 
Do you think Steam could ever make a comeback? No, I don't think Steam will ever make a comeback because, <laughs> well, that being said, every Navy sub is a Steam vehicle. Um, it, it, it doesn't really, because it's not as efficient as it could be. Uh, it uses a lot of water, and in California, water is obviously a precious resource now. So you can't, like the big advance, that's 300 gallons of water to fire it. Back in the day, I mean, you just, put, and it was fine, but you, no, because it just, <laughs> the fun thing about this car is it comes with a manual. And the manual says, things for your man to do on a daily basis. <laughs> on a daily basis. On a daily basis, things you had to check every day. And if you have one of these cars, this car was $25,000 in 1925. So you, you had a man, your chauffeur. Or several. Yeah, who would, who would undertake these various things. You know, check this, check. The only disadvantage to the car is everything has to be hospital clean because it's, it's, it's superheated the steam. One drop of water expands 2,500 times at 850 degrees. So you literally spit and <laughs> It, it, it's like combustion. That's why it makes steam so quickly. You have 600 feet of coil with a quart of water in it. Um, the, the, the fire, I put a probe in this with a gauge, and I was going down the road, and I said, oh, 2,500, wow, 2,500 degrees is pretty hot. Oh, now, oh, okay, now, so, oh, 1,500, it's settling. The probe had melted. <laughs> <laughs> it was a 3,500 degree fire. So one drop of water, when it's hit with 3,500 degrees, boom, literally expands and makes steam and pushes the car forward. The cool thing about it is it's a closed system. So it would meet emission regulations up to about the year 2000 because <laughs> it uses the same water over and over again. So, I mean, it was kind of cool. But no, I don't think steam would ever make a comeback because, well, here's a perfect example. You know the biggest problem with electric cars? You gotta plug it in. <laughs> That's people, they, they get home and they go, oh, I have to go like this. <laughs> I mean, people don't want to do anything. <laughs> I mean, the Wankel engine failed because the manual says, check oil every second, gas fill up. Oh, oh, Can't have a up. man to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> I mean, people want trouble free, nothing. They don't want to be involved. It's what, probably why a lot of people don't really bond with an automobile anymore because you can't do anything to make it better. It, it, that's, it's pretty foolproof when you get it now. But something like this required so much effort and just pages of things for your man to do. I mean, he's through driving you around. Oh, now he has to go in the garage and work on this thing for an hour and a half. So. Well, you gave me a great segue because you were talking about things that had to be checked. And so we have a check car, the Tatra. Okay, yes, grown. Come on, grown. Okay. Thank you. Now you see why I'm a professional comedian. <laughs> okay. This is a joke I have chosen not to do at every, every point in my career, just for the obvious nature of the joke. But I, for Donald, once again, being a neophyte, this would be... That is a fantastic car. Uh, any, 1937 it, Tatra T77? Uh, 1938, actually. 38. But yeah, okay. It is designed by Hans Ludwinka, the only guy to sue Porsche and win, actually. He was a contemporary of, of Porsche, and he, uh, he sued Porsche because he invented the swing axle with Porsche, and he actually won. Um, interesting guy. He, he was not Czechoslovakian. He was Austrian. He didn't speak Czech. He built these cars. It's a V8 engine in the rear. Magnesium block, overhead cam. Uh, it was guaranteed to get 20 miles per gallon at 60 miles an hour. And because it had swing axles and the engine was way back here, kind of an interesting story. When Hitler invaded, Czechos invaded Czechoslovakia, he took these, the German high command took these as, as staff cars, and they were deceptively fast. And the first week, seven Nazi officers were killed because they came off exits too quickly and rolled the car. This car actually killed more Nazis than the Czech army at the time. <laughs> so it was, so at some point, what happened was uh, Hitler, Hitler uh, uh, told no more Tatras, just leave them there. Leave, and that's why they all stayed in Czechoslovakia. Just leave them there, walk away from them. I don't want anybody driving these things. And that's, but they're wonderful cars to drive. Just need to put 40 pounds of pressure in the rear tires and you'll be fine. But it's a fascinating vehicle. You have the engine here, V8, 
a firewall, luggage department, another firewall, rear seat, front seat. So you go down the road, it's, it's silent. It really was a Tucker before there was a Tucker. I, Tucker gets all the credit for this <laughs> car they developed, but this was a finished automobile that was actually quite, uh, quite sophisticated and, again, fun to drive. <laughs> And the aerodynamics are very interesting. Yes, this is uh, the, the CD on this car, a coefficient of drag is 0.27. Which was uh, the interesting thing was, the 1970s. Well, basically. you know, it's a little unfair because cars don't have a good coefficient of drag anymore because you have to have downforce because the car can go 200 miles an hour. This car was meant to cruise at 60 or 70. So downforce was not something that played. So consequently, the underside of the car, and has a big fin in the back you can't see, and it would go down the road. You take your foot off the gas at 60, and just you coast. There's no, there's no, no, drag, no drag if you slow down. So yeah, it was a fascinating car. You got the three headlights in front. Um, it's really a case of original thinking. They were on the other side of the Tatra Mountains, and obviously no internet, and they, you didn't really know what people were doing in America or even in Germany. So he just built these cars on his own. Um, when we took the transmission apart, it's completely different. Everything is the opposite of what you would think. And it's like a, the back of a watch. It's such a beautiful piece of engineering. It, it's really a fascinating car. Meanwhile, what people in America were thinking was this. Right, that's the Chrysler Airflow. Now, one thing, here's something maybe you don't know. Uh, the guy named Breer, uh, who worked for uh, Chrysler, uh, he had a cousin who was Czechoslovakian. And the wheels are exactly the same. See the wheels? Mm -hmm. I, apparently they communicated. This was the Chrysler Airflow. This car was a huge failure in America because nobody wanted aerodynamics. They wanted it, you know, the, it, 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 I kind of laugh when I hear uh, Chevy has a truck ad where their trucks are made of steel as opposed to the Ford, which is made of aluminum, which will bend and fold with a steel <laughs> car. And that's you want to drive a beer can. Yeah, when they used to, uh, uh, try and sell these, you know, the, the, the regular cars had the big radiator like this. It would push its way through the wind regardless. <laughs> they didn't need aerodynamics. And, that, and that's where they sold it. But that, that was the 34 Chrysler Airflow with the waterfall grill. It was the only year they did that. Very aerodynamic. If you Google this car, you will see a piece of footage of a guy in 1934 driving it, and then he rolls it off a cliff. Yes. And then he drives away because it was the first car to have a completely steel roof. Most cars had wood at the period. Completely steel wolf, uh, roof, it didn't crush. Had all kinds of innovative features on it. And it just, that was a classic case of like, something being ahead of its time, you know. Did you ever wonder how many takes they did uh, of the cars <laughs> driving off? You know, it looked like one, t I mean, the guy's driving the car. It's, it's an endless piece of yes. footage. He drives along and the car rolls down the <laughs> hill and then he drives off. I mean, hilarious. Yeah. I knew I meant to make a left rather than a right. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> And speaking of um, powerful, this is a very powerful car. Yeah, that's a Model 66 Pierce Arrow. Uh, that was, and is, still is to this day, the biggest engine ever put in an automobile. It's 826 cubic inch six. <laughs> it's 14 liters. Um, th uh, this engine was later put in fire trucks and everything else. Uh, it's a wonderful motor. It moves so slowly in terms of with the long stroke, 1800 would be the end of the world for revolutions. When you go down the road at 70, you're turning 600, 700 RPM. The truck with this was, Packard had a V12, a Cadillac had a V8, and this seemed stodgy and old fashioned, but it, it's so bulletproof. It's a cast aluminum body. That's a 1918. Um, you know, it has so much torque. I pulled away from a light once and went, Oh, what's, what's wrong with it? Oh, I'm in fourth gear. <laughs> I mean, that's how torquey it is. I mean, it, it's amazing. And this car has not been restored. It's been, this was owned by the governor of California at the time. Um, and it's really only had five owners. And uh, it, it, geez, it's just a, it's a, it's a, again, a wonderful car to drive. Um, it, it's, it's really fascinating. You've never been in a torque monster like this thing. It's, it, it, that's something that's really missing in modern cars. The idea that, you know, you just let the clutch out, don't even touch the gas and the thing will, will walk away. So that's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a cool car. And again, for something slightly different, which uh, always happens in uh, Jay Leno's garage, this is one of my favorite vehicles that you own. 
So this car is really interesting. It's a, I call it a shot well. Uh, okay, I'll get that. Uh, uh, um, a guy named Bob Shotwell was 17 in 1931, and he wanted a car, and it was in the middle of the Depression. And his father said, if you want a car, you're going to have to build it yourself. So he and his father went to the junkyard, and they bought a bunch of Model A parts, a bunch of Model T parts, a bunch of sheet metal. They bought an Indian Ford similar to motorcycle engine, and he went home, and he built this car. And he was really quite a smart guy. He went on to be a pilot for Pan Am. Uh, and when he finished his car, he and his brother drove it from Minnesota to Alaska to San Diego and back. Uh, they kept a diary of all the people that gave him free food and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's a fascinating story. And it's just a little homemade car. And when he was well into his 80s, um, they were taking him off to retirement home. And he tracked me down. I didn't know him. I, I still never met him. And he, he said, if I give you this thing, we promise to restore it, because he's always afraid that some motorcycle guys would take the four-cylinder engine and put it in a motorcycle, because those are valuable now, and, and junk the rest of the car. It was in pretty rough shape when I got it. So uh, we went to Minnesota, picked it up. I talked to him a lot on the phone. His family still comes around to, uh, to see the car. In fact, his, uh, his uh, a great granddaughter is uh, Michelle Williams, you know, the actress, Academy Award winner, or Academy Award nominee. So, yeah, and his family comes, and we have his picture on the wall. That's it behind it, and the story about how we met, and the pictures of him building the car when he was seven. I mean, this is what people did before Netflix. You know, they made stuff. <laughs> you know, you know, so, I mean, he actually built the whole car, and he drove it to Alaska. Alaska. And then to San Diego. You know, and you know, with what, $5? I mean, just, just crazy. But I mean, it was really, it's really fascinating. So we tried to honor his spirit and uh, keep the whole thing going. And of course, it's fun to drive. It's guess, always great yeah. to see vehicles with, with personal connections. And right. I know that this next car has some slight personal connection uh, with you. OK. Uh, well, that's my 55 Buick Roadmaster. I, that's kind of, <laughs> I've had that car. Bought that car in 1972, met my wife in that car, my wife and I dated in that car. I mean, it's, a, it's a, just a fun thing. Um, I parked it in my mother-in-law's driveway, where it sat for 16 years when younger, prettier cars came along. You know. <laughs> and, but you never sold it. No, I never sold it. And it sat there outside, you know, and then the tires went flat. and then. One day, I went over to see my mother-in-law, and there was a note on it. And someone obviously doesn't care about this card. Like, oh, no, I don't care about it. <laughs> so I felt so awful that we took it back to the shop. And it's got now, it's got C5 Corvette suspension. It's got a 572 big block in it. And, and it, it's air conditioning. And it's, it's a fascinating car. It's, it's a great car. And I, I, it, it just, because I, I sort of lived in that car when I first came. You know, when you come to LA, First you get a car, then you find a place to live. <laughs> so, and when that car was big enough, you could sleep in the back seat. Oh, it was fabulous. It was a wonderful car. So, so yeah, that was a, that's a special one. And uh, speaking of crying cars. Crying cars. This that? is probably one of the most spectacular cars in your entire collection. And uh, Well, you know, a lady gave me that. It was sitting in a yard. She was going to send it to the crusher. And she said, you want it? And I said, yeah, sure. So we, it, uh, the idea with this one will probably put a Mazda drivetrain in it and uh, just make it a nice little run around car. And my wife's always liked these, so the idea was to surprise her, which has been ruined now that you're here. She said, <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you, Donald, for anytime, causing anytime. trouble in my marriage. <laughs> well, it, it, the it, idea it, was we we're going to finish it, make a nice car, and surprise her. But of course, Donald has now ruined that. And it got to the... This is uh, also one of my favorite cars of yours. Um, this really incredibly dramatic, another Duesenberg. That's the only Duesenberg ever designed in a wind tunnel. Uh, this was built for uh, Josiah Lilly, Eli Lilly's grand, uh, son. Uh, this was just, just meant to run over poor people with. That was the <laughs> idea. The Danny Warbucks movie. Yeah, you would just go down the street and just run over people selling apples or whatever it would be. It's 1934. Yeah. You it's haven't 1934. got any food. You've got no place to live, but I've got this. You're, you're and... driving this stupid, ridiculous car. Well, the interesting thing is there's less room inside it than an MG. <laughs> and Josiah Lee did not drive. He had a chauffeur, so the two of them would sit like this. Um, 
it's truly aerodynamic. I mean, those headlights look like implants on a bad stripper, but <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> your dad will explain that to you later. <laughs> uh, but they're actually more aerodynamic. It's actually more aerodynamic than if the fender was actually cut. You know, if, 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 it, if it was smooth. So it, it's the first aerodynamic Duesenberg ever built. Um, I got it. When did I get it? When I got it, it was a tow truck. It had a rig in the back of it. Because it was just an old car. Uh, the guy I bought it from was going to restore it. Uh, <laughs> that was a really funny story. He, the guy invented, uh, he held the patents to Lexon plastic. So he had a gazillion dollars. But he didn't like to spend any money. You know? So when I bought the car, he knew what it was. And it was half a million bucks. And I went, well, Okay, and it wasn't finished, it needed everything. Well, okay, so I'll buy it. He goes, no, I don't want to take the money because uh, I'm not paying the capital gains. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay a 28% capital gain. God damn the government, I'm not. He just goes on and on, you know. He goes, you just take the car, you pay me late. Okay, so I got the car, okay. He's now like 86 years old. I have the car, and I, we start restoring it, you know, and I would call him every couple of months. No, no, God damn the government, God damn the, he, just, he was just going these rants about taxes. Huh? Okay, now the car's finished, I take it to Pebble Beach, and we win an award. And I still don't own it. Okay. He's now 88. So I call the wife, let me try the wife. She goes, well, let me put him on the phone. No, God damn, he starts again, you know. So I'm thinking, he's going to be 89 years old, and I don't own it, and I know this is going to be awful. And then what happened was... Then capital gains dropped to 15%. Well, I don't know whether it was Clinton or whatever it was, but anyway, it, and it just dropped to 15%, and he goes, oh, okay, you can pay me now, and then he died two weeks later. So, so it worked out okay. Now, as opposed to your Pebble Beach winning Duesenberg, this is a car that most people would recognize as not a show car. No, not a show car, but always a race car. I, I bought this six years ago in Orange County. I paid $80,000 for it. It was in, <laughs> no, no, it was in a container. No engine, no drivetrain. Okay, so I bought it. And then the guy I bought it from said, well, I got the engine stuff if you want. I said, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to go. Okay, fine. It's okay. And he said to me, oh, the engine was rebuilt in Germany and all, you know, oh, okay, yeah, whatever, fine, you know. So he took it back to my garage and the engine's in the crate. And we opened the crate and there's assembly lube on everything. And we put the engine on our dyno. It made 235 horsepower. So it was rebuilt in Germany. He just never lost interest, never put it in the car. And so we put it together and mechanically it's fine. I mean, it's, it's the only gold wing you can sit on the fender, you can take it to a Cars and Coffee. You know, kids want to sit in it, you can put them in, it's fine. They can sit. It really doesn't drive any better or any worse than a 100-point car, you know? And I can see through the mirror because they don't have stupid fitted luggage back there, you know? <laughs> so, and that's another thing. You know, guys, when you do these cars, you get the fitted luggage. Your wife's not going to put her stuff in your stupid fitted luggage, okay? They're just, okay, they, they don't. They just, they don't. They, the things don't fit, the luggage smells like gasoline, whatever it is. There's always a reason, so don't get the fitted luggage. You, she, they're not going to use it. You're going to have a big fight, and it's, it's fine. So anyway, that's, that's pretty much where that is. But it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful driving car. It looks better without the bumpers on it. And, you know, people love it the way it is. It just has such a patina. And the fact that you could just park it on the street without somebody coming up and doing this or bumping. You know, we scraped it on one of the videos. That's OK. I mean, it's a car, and you use it as a car. You know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's worth any more restored than it is now. It would cost you probably three fifty, four hundred thousand to restore this car. And it wouldn't drive any better. You know, brakes are done, transmission's done, engine's fine. It's fine. I mean, maybe weather stripping and a few little things like that. So you drive it in the rain. But yeah, I drive it all the time. You're being true to the car's history because it was a race car it and it still car. looks like an honest and race car. And it had never been damaged, which is the important thing. It had never been hit, which is the important thing. So yeah, that's what makes it kind of cool. Tony Nancy did the interior. Uh, he was a famous uh, 
uh, hot rod uh, guy. Most of the Southern California guys know him. And Junior's House of Color, that was candy apple red originally. It just sort of deteriorated to just the red, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the story. Apple plus the candy. And just a wonderful car to drive. You know, I always had a prejudice against these cars, because when I was a kid, they always had that skinny little gear shift knob. And I, you know, as a kid, I was used to the big hearse knob, you know, or the giant pistol grip. Thing. And I always thought, oh, what a delicate little thing. It must break. It, it is, that is the first. Muriel always gets the thing as the first supercar. That is the first supercar. It is just unbelievable to drive. I mean, right up to, what, 135, whatever it is, it's just rock steady. It's a lot of fun. It's built like a tank. It's really an amazing car. It's really the first supercar, I think. And you've got a, a commitment to finding new technologies and also performance, so talk about this. this well, that's a car it. called the Echo Jet. We built that for uh, a SEMA one year. It uses a Honeywell LT-101 jet engine out of one of the big attack helicopters. One's going by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we use the GM Design Studio to design the cars, one of those things where I don't know why napkins are always used by designers. You ever notice that? They, they was designed on a napkin. The F1 McLaren designed on a napkin. And somehow designers, designers are always they seem to carry napkins around yeah. with them all the time. And they write on them. And that, but, but that's really true. We sketched it on a napkin in a restaurant. And then we gave it to Frank Sacito and those guys at GM. And, and, and you know, we work with them. I'm, I'm not a designer, but we use their input. And uh, it's all carbon fiber. And we built the whole thing at the shop. We don't have an autoclave, but we sent that part out. But, it's uh, mostly Corvette uh, transmission and brakes. Uh, Alcoa gave us the aluminum for those wheels, which is really interesting because that's an aluminum that doesn't dull, it doesn't polish, and it doesn't get dirty. Mm. It's fascinating. There's nothing you can do to them other than hose them off. It doesn't, doesn't water spot. I mean, it's an amazing alloy. I still haven't, figured, they haven't told me what it is yet, but it works fine. And we took uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson out in it. We went 165 with him, and, then, and the window blew out. And he, <laughs> some reason, he seemed concerned, so we <laughs> Yeah, I actually um, took the picture of the car from this side because there's actually the door is off. The door's the off right side. now. We're fixing but the window, the, yeah, yeah. But also now, tell us a little bit about what this vehicle runs on. Well, it, it was meant to run on biofuel, which was popular like 10 years ago until people realized taco shells would be 10 bucks a piece if you <laughs> yeah. So the idea of using corn, so, you know. You know, you think the world's mad at us now. Now we're turning food into gasoline. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it never really, but it runs on diesel. It runs on JP8. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, any any sort of kerosene thing like that. And speaking of visions of alternate fuels and propulsion units, one of my well, favorite this cars. is one of my favorite cars of all time. When I was a kid, you know, uh, every couple of weeks there'll be some gray-haired guy looking through the looking through the fence, you know. I was at the World's Fair in 1964. Me too, come on in, I'll show you the car. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know. I went with my dad to see this at the World's Fair, and it was in a pit going in a circle. And my father, for Christ's sake, wait, look at a goddamn car going around. So, <laughs> so my father, I was there for hours, for Christ's sake, let's get the hell out of you watching a car going around. There. My father just didn't, didn't get it all. Just, <laughs> just watch this thing go around in circles and circles. Uh, but. Um, when Chrysler went bankrupt, I tried to show up with a bag of money and went to the banks, and they said, oh, well, Chrysler's got to come up with some dough. They've got to show good faith. Why'd you sell? OK, fine. So I bought it, and I'm the original owner. I'm the first owner of the car, which is cool. Uh, <laughs> thank you. The, the warranty is null and void, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, but it's OK, because you've got you It's a, a fascinating engine. automobile. What it was was, in 1963, when the rest of the world barely had piston-powered cars, Americans are going to have jet cars. Every magazine, is this the future? Coming in two years, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. And it's not particularly faster than anything else. It's about the same as a 318 Chrysler V8. The idea was it was a personal luxury car. It had one spark plug, had no cooling systems, no fluid other than uh, some engine oil. And, and, uh, the turbine is hooked up directly to a torque flight transmission without the torque converter. It runs directly off the input shaft. There's no warm-up time. Uh, and what they did with these was they let Americans do the testing on it. You wrote a letter, Chrysler had a contest. 209 Americans were given one of these for three months each. Each got it for 90 days, and they gave you a diary. And what do you like, what don't you like? It ran on anything other than leaded fuel. 
But when gasoline was 26 cents a gallon, there was really no reason. They ran on diesel. When they took it to Mexico, they ran it on tequila. They did. When they took it to France, they filled the tank with Chanel number no. five and drove around with that. <laughs> the idea was any fuel that burns with oxygen, you could use in that. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool. The thing that killed it was emissions. It's almost impossible to make a clean jet. You just, it just doesn't work. It just, it, 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 you know, you, you, when you stand behind it, you, you smell it. But it runs cool. It runs at less temperature than, you know, I would always read these articles how they set the grass on fire and all this kind of stuff <laughs> from people who never experienced it. But it ran, it, the um, temperature coming out the exhaust was 120 to 140 degrees, which was less than, uh, less than an internal combustion engine. So it, it's, it was really a fascinating, to this day it still feels like the future. When you get on the road, mm. it, it makes just enough noise, you know, so it sounds kind of, kind of like the Jetsons. It's quiet, it's comfortable. I mean, it's a great car. And they built 55 of them and wound up crushing most of them because when the program ended, Chrysler offered to donate them to museums, but museums wouldn't take it because it's a new car. Who wants to look at a new car in a museum, you know? <laughs> so most were crushed. The bodies were done in Italy, and uh, Ghia did it. I think yes. Engel is the, the guy who designed the Thunderbird designed this. Elvin and he, Engel. Uh, yeah, Elvin Engel. You can see from the, you can see some Thunderbird styling in it, but I think it's the greatest post-war American car. It's just so fascinating to drive and so different, and it still feels like the future when you get, it's 1963. And I was absolutely devastated as a young boy in New York City that my family, who didn't own a car, wasn't chosen to be one of the... Uh, yeah, did you write a letter? Guys. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, oh well. This is also a very interesting story of a hybrid. That's oh, a very early hybrid. That's a 1916 Owens Magnetic. Uh, hybrid cars have always had the same problem that they have today, battery technology. So the idea was this is the, this engine, this, the gas engine, uh, the flywheel works as a magnet, and it, there's no mechanical connection between the engine and, quote, the transmission or the electric engine. It's an electric car, but the gas engine <coughs> spins, turns the generator, which drives the electric motor, which drives the rear wheels. And they called it the car of a thousand speeds because you could move the lever any which way to get what it, it was good for people who couldn't drive a stick or if you were disabled in some way and you couldn't push a clutch, whatever it might be. So Caruso had one of these and a couple of other people had them. And the idea you go down the road, you just go, much like the transformer on a Lionel train, you would just click it through the various quadrants and, and you would uh, sort of go along. And it still works fine, it's pretty amazing. You know, these early electrics, I've got a 1909 Baker electric, which I restored, but I never touched the motor. Beautifully hand-wound copper wire, like a Did stick. Did you see is, my next slide? Oh, they, oh, there you go, no, there you go, almost, yeah. That's another one, that's like my wife's favorite car, because it's the only car we have with a deer come up to the window and look in, <laughs> you know? And it's, because it doesn't make any noise. Um, it's fantastic. It goes 80 to 100 miles on a charge, you know, because batteries really haven't changed a whole lot. Um, this had electric lights when, this is 1909, was which is really 1906. They just built the same car. But most people had acetylene. But these were, these were uh, a lot of rich guys bought these for their wives. That's what killed the electric car first time around, because it was a woman's car and you can't sell a guy a woman's car, you know, that kind of nonsense. Like even the ad says, buy your wife an electric, you know, and they show her like a beaming with pride. She, you know, and she can't go too far, you know? So you can, <laughs> I mean, that was the, uh, I mean, that was the, I mean, that's what it was, it's 1906, so you could, you could see your wife go down, all right, you could, she's gonna you go down that running off and the, the batteries are gonna die by the time she gets there. Yeah, that's what, that's what it was. But the charging unit for it looks like a Frankenstein movie. It's got a big bulb and, the electricity comes out, uh, hilarious. Right. But it's, it's, it's like driving a phone booth. It's a wonderful car. I mean, you, you sit up high on it, and like I said, it does go 80 to 100 miles on a charge. And for looking at Christmas lights, it's the greatest car in the world. We have a 1914 Detroit electric that we're putting Tesla power in, which is going to be So when you're, when you're on the freeway in Southern California and you see this you 1914 telephone booth yeah. coming by you, yeah. and the fast lane, it's, it's yeah. Jay. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And speaking of going fast, you've always been a lover of supercars and performance cars, and this is a very early one. 
That's a 1913 Mercer raceabout. I think most people are probably familiar with that car. I think it's the first true American sports car. I mean, uh, what they used to do back in the day, they put the biggest, heaviest engine they could in a lightweight car. And they went fast, but they plowed in the corners and they couldn't stop because they were so heavy. Mercer was the first one to have a light car with a small engine, five liters, which is very tiny. For, you know, you had 14 liter Fiats and 12 liter thing. With, so it's a, a T-head engine. It's the most satisfying car to drive. I remember Ken Purdy said, it drives about, the, about as fast as a 65 MGB, about in terms of speed. I mean, it'll do it will do 100 miles an hour. At least we've had 100 miles an hour on the speed on it. And believe me, 100 miles an hour on that really feels like 100 miles an hour. <laughs> but it's, a, it's just the most wonderful car to drive. You call it the raceabout because the headlights just lift off and the fenders unbolt, and then you went racing. I mean, a completely stock one came in second in the very first Indianapolis 500. The Marmon won that. But the guy bought it, drove it to the race, entered it, came in second. <laughs> Car, can you do that? Go down to the dealership, give me that one there, I'm going to the race tomorrow. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, what, what beats that? I mean, it's, it's wonderfully involving. You have to hand pump the fuel pressure to keep it going. And you have to you know, hand pump the oil. I mean, it, it, it's just a lot of stuff to do. But again, it, it's really fun to drive. It's a big four-speed transmission, but you have big, giant gears like this. So there's no need for synchro mesh, because you're not the engine's not turning that fast, so consequently, you can speed shift it, go through the gears with it. Fantastic, wonderful car. And fun to drive. Well, I'll bet these next two. Yeah, I wonder two, what's the thing that holds I'll, all these I'll cars. I'll bet in. these next two cars aren't at all fun to drive uh, because, you know, who would want to have a pair of mirrors? Okay, I talked about this in an article. There are some things you do that you don't talk about. When I backed my orange mirror into my yellow mirror. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're not going to get any sympathy from anybody. That's one of those people go, good, good, I'm glad you, you know, you just, you, you can't, so you don't even tell people that. You just, just sort of let it go because you just look like an idiot. You got, right, you're too lazy to go, you know, we get conditioned to look at that screen, so you just back up now. <laughs> but anyway, but the, but the cool thing is the yellow one was bought new by Dean Martin. And uh, Dino's kid uh, uh, hit a berm in the road and cracked a pan in the engine seat. So a buddy of mine was a school teacher. He bought it. Uh, the dealer said it's going to cost more to fix and it's worth. You might as well junk it. And he didn't want to junk it. There was sat, a time. Sat in his garage for you. This is the 80s. And his wife said, just give it to Leno. He likes all this guy. Oh, you can have it. So he gives cost, now he's hung himself. <laughs> but in, in 82, 83, it wasn't worth anything. I mean, it's hard to believe, but it wasn't worth anything. It was just an old sports car, you know? And so that was the story on that one, yeah. So that was kind of cool. And having that, you had to get an S. Yeah, I mean, I saw that one up in Canada. It was $80,000 in 88. And that seemed high at the time, because there was 60 to 65. But I said, oh, let me grab it, and so I did. So, I mean, that's, you know, buying too soon is good, you know? Exactly. Now, of course, performance, as we saw in the Mercer Raceabout and in these Muras, is very important to you. And uh, sometimes you take performance to a, uh, extremes. <laughs> well, that's the tank car. That's the, do I have sexual problems car. When you <laughs> <laughs> this enormous, ridiculous engine, you just, you're just overcompensating it. <laughs> it's a uh, M47 patent tank engine. Um, uh, when I got it, it had two Stromberg carburetors on it. It had 800 horsepower, and it got two miles per gallon. Uh, we went to our friend Gail Banks. We put uh, twin turbochargers on it. We put an Allison six-speed double overdrive transmission. Now it has between, uh, between 11 and 1300 horsepower and it gets five to six miles per gallon. So we've doubled the mileage, so, so that's- Ready for the yeah, uh, so mobile we're back, gas we're economy helping, run. Yeah, we're, no, we're doing things for the economy, so that's, uh, that's, that's good. It weighs five tons. This is Schwarzenegger's favorite car. When Arnold Schwarzenegger comes to the garage, he goes, I love this car, this is fantastic. <laughs> he just like, he just, the grill looks like his face. Now, it, it, it does. It, 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 it's a fantastic guy. You, you go down the road and see such a thing as this. is fantastic. He, he just stands there and goes, fantastic. I love this guy. He wants, he, wants, he wants to buy one. I go, there aren't any around. But, uh, 
but uh, yeah, but he loves that kind. The other one's an aerial atom, which is all about power to weight ratio. Are those actually? The aerial atom weighs twice what the Gordon Murray rocket weighs. Mm. But that one has the Ecotec engine. We built a little V8 using two Hayabusa motorcycle heads that we're putting on that. We've dynoed that engine at 488 horsepower and normally aspirated. So once we get it in that, it'll, I live in a hilly area, so it'll <laughs> get over the hills a little quicker than that. So, but it's got so much body on it, though. That's the, the entire yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, and this, of course, is a uh, car that everybody acknowledges as uh, one of the only certainly certified modern absolute collectible blue chip cars and I know that you were very sad uh, this weekend to see one sell for not much money. Yeah, Herb Chambers car sold for 15 and a half million dollars. Um, you know, the, it's, I don't know anything about stocks or bonds, I don't know anything about that stuff, but if you're a little bit car centric, you can actually make money on some of this stuff. I bought this car in 98, it was $800,000, which seemed ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I called McLaren and said, any car, we have one, we have a black one here. How much? 800000 I said, well, that's about what it costs new. Well, yeah, but I said, it's a used car. I said, <laughs> I said, you know something? I'll tell you what, I'll call you back in two weeks. If it's still there, okay, I'll buy it. Yeah. So two weeks I called back, it's still there? The guy goes, yeah, I go, <laughs> I said, all, all, all right, I'll buy it. So I, I, I bought it. It was the best investment I ever made. And it, it's hilarious because it has... That classic, but it comes with air conditioning. But if you want good air conditioning, it's 25,000 extra. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just that classic British, it comes with this. Like the Norton had the assist self-starter. You hit, you, 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 with the Norton, you hit the starter button and go, rrr, rrr, and now you have to kick it, okay? <laughs> you only got like one, rrr, rrr, and, and this, it, it had, it's just, it just the idea that he's explaining to me, well, in Britain, we don't really need that much air conditioning, so we put a cr they just put a crappy unit in. <laughs> I mean, it's an $800,000 car. So it's 25000 to get the good air conditioning. So while it was in England, I upgraded to the good air conditioning. But it was one of those things where, here's where your government comes in. It was a used, remember they had the 5% luxury tax on car, except on used car. So... <laughs> I, I get it, and it gets to the dock. And the guy, how much you pay for this car? It's eight hundred thousand. No used car costs that much. You got to pay the five percent. I go, no, it's a used car. Here's uh, Ben Pond. That was the guy. Here's the original owner. Here's the paperwork. No, we don't believe that. He said, no, we can hold it for six months in our lockup, or you can pay. I said, all right, all right, pay it. So I'll pay. I, what am I going to do? So I pay it. So you get, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm turning into the old guy. I've got everything. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. I want to sell my McLaren, yeah, but yeah, don't pay yeah. me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pay me now. Now, the McLaren F1 is certainly the pinnacle of, of engineering and performance. And there are other cars that other people think of. I mean, we got the reason why I buy these cars. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Continue. Oh, oh we're what else, getting what there. Else we got? What else we're we got? getting there. Because how many people own McLaren F1s and Corvairs? Actually, there's one Corvair in this picture and one Yanko Stinger. Right, right. The Yanko Stinger, for those who don't know. Don Yanko was sort of the Carroll Shelby of Chevrolet. He didn't like what uh, Carroll Shelby was doing with Cobras, getting, getting all these Ford products out there. He was a Chevrolet dealer. And the Corvair, to, I, I, I really call it the poor man's Porsche. I mean, it's a flat six with 180 horsepower, had four carburetors. He did a little bit of body work. He bought a J.C. Whitney Grant steering wheel for $14.99. He put on the car, did some suspension. And they, in 1966, they actually won the, what, the SCCA, SCCA championship, beat yeah. Porsche. Uh, it's the most European car. To this day, millennials will go, what is, is that a Carmen Gear? What kind of car is that? That's a Chevy. No, oh, come on. What? Well, the, I mean, because it doesn't look like a modern car. There's no grill in the front. I mean, it's a very European, it's probably the most radical American car ever built. And here's the funny part about it. It was deemed a failure because they only sold 1.8 million. <laughs> Mustang had sold 3 million by this time, so this car was considered a failure. I mean, now you sell, sell 40,000, they make you president of the company. But, <laughs> I mean, in the 60s, 1.8 million was oh, oh, it's not very good. You know, Round but, I mean, it's the, it's the best bargain starter car I can think of. I, I really think they will be collectible someday. Uh, the, the Anko Stingers are collectible because... Don Yanko got his own serial numbers. He got 100 of them. That's car number 54, not the TV show. And, <laughs> and uh, 
it's a wonderful handling car. John Finch uh, loved them, and, and, and it, it's truly, I mean, it, it, it moved America forward, but it moved it back, too, because the Corvair was such, considered such a failure at the time that nobody ever took a chance again with air cooling or rear engine or mid-engine or anything of that nature. It was engine in the front, transmission in the middle, drivers in the rear, let's just do it the way we always did it. So it, it was a double-edged sword. You always admired the, uh, the engineering and the, and the, and the um, invention that, that went into it. Yeah, they're like wonderful yeah. cars. You know, I remember at the time they used to sell the driving gloves and all this kind of stuff. But they truly were sporty cars, and they were, they were really the most European-American car ever built. Well, we're going to get off of four wheels and all get right. on to two. If this will go forward. Yes. Ah, there we go. And this is just like, you know, your average everyday uh, well, motorcycle that's, you find in a corner. That's probably uh, the only piece I, that's not registered to run. That is not the very first Bruff Superior, but one of the first three. It's the only 90 bore model they made. It's very Edwardian. Look at the front brake. It's a bicycle brake, you know, where you, <laughs> you squeeze and the two blocks. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that's approximately 19... 19, 1920, something like that. The Bruff Superior were the first super bikes, the first bikes guaranteed to go 100 miles an hour. Lawrence of Arabia had them. That's how they got quite famous. Lawrence of Arabia went everywhere in them, and he raced a biplane, and he wrote about them quite eloquently and, and, and spoke about them as well. Uh, so also the most beautiful gas tank in motorcycling. And that one being the oldest in the world and the only one uh, that's sort of parked, I don't really ride that one. But the others, the other bruffs I ride all the time. And uh, speaking of art objects, and very much not the broff, a Zweirad Union Cavalier. How yeah, this is what I call a Donald Osborne motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's just about the style. You can, you can see Donald bow tie flapping in the wind, driving this, <laughs> driving this through Palm Beach or some such place. Just, <laughs> Spewing out advice whether people want it or not, just going along. <laughs> and it's, it, I mean, this, this, this would be, this is your favorite bike, right? It is. Oh, like I say, because it has what your dad called stylage. Stylage. Stylage, that's this, right. This is, this is a two-wheeler with stylage. And speaking of stylage, explain this, Mr. Leno. Uh, that is a really <laughs> odd, a lot of people don't know this, but Studebaker, was the Mercedes-Benz distributor in the 50s. Mercedes-Benz teamed up with Studebaker. And that's basically a Studebenz, is what you'd call it. Uh, there was a guy named Jack Ryan, which was similar to the, uh, the, uh, the, in the, the Clancy, novel, yeah, the Clancy exactly. books. This is really fascinating. This guy invented the Barbie doll. And he made a gazillion dollars. And he decided to start his own car company. So he took a Studebaker chassis, put a Mercedes-Benz front end on it, put a 413 Chrysler engine in it. I mean, it's really something from the, like the TV show Mad Men. There are twin holsters for guns on each side. It has a bar where you can carry liquor. I mean, so you're driving with liquor and guns in the car, OK? I mean, it was just a different era. Cop pulls over, you have two guns and liquor in the car. I mean, it is just the most oddball thing. Uh, Mercedes-Benz saw this and said, get, get the hell with it. <laughs> but he built six of them. And uh, I've, I've yet to restore this one. It was given to me by someone who, who saved it. It was built in the 60s. And the just Jack Ryan character was just a, a character. You know, that big house in Beverly Hills, crazy parties, you know, all that kind of 60s, swinging 60s stuff. And, and then that, that was his car. So it's, we, it's, it's, we're not in a real hurry to get that one done. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we're going to um, wrap this up now with uh, a view of very different vehicles and actually machines. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got, uh, we've got a 66 old Soronado, a 58 Lancia Aurelia, the uh, Mercer race about we saw before, and an 1830 English steam engine. 1832, yeah. I think it's the oldest steam engine in America running on steam. And back in the day, don't forget this is before oil was discovered. So what they used to do was they would slaughter pigs and just rub the grease on everything because whale oil was too expensive. So, I mean, obviously, he ate a lot of bacon, I guess. But, <laughs> but 
but imagine what kind of disease, what kind of just slaughtering pigs and rubbing grease and coming home for, honey, I'm home, you know, <laughs> honey, wash this shirt, would you believe it? I mean, I can't, I mean, I can't imagine what, what the, and there's no OSHA on this thing, there's no, you just, you get near this thing, it'll just take your head off if you get too close to it, it it's hilarious, it's hilarious, it was just personal responsibility, that was the name of the day. Or, yeah. We have reached the end of our journey. Uh, we, oh. And so can anybody find the common thread that holds all of these quite bizarre things together? I'm guessing this young man. How old are you, son? I am 10 years old. OK. You're about mentally the same age as Donald. So I'm guessing, <laughs> I'm I'm guessing, guessing you have found the thread that holds all these together. What do you think? I think it's. Fun to draw. Yes, there you go. That's one. Thank That's you. One. Thank you. Thank there are you. Four. Thank you, son. Very good. There are four. Very components. bright young man. Don. There are four components. One has been identified. Fun. Can anybody think of another one? What is that? Hi who, who said? Who said the H word? History, History is History. the other. Nostalgia. Interesting. What's that? Interesting. History. Interesting. And. Technology. Technology. Very good. Yeah. And there's one other. Who rescues cars? What about, what about? Hey, Leno, now. <laughs> emotion. emotion. Jay collects with heft. Oh, History, so emotion, fun, and technology. The key to his collection. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Do we have In the questions? last few any minutes we have, actually, we are a little out of front. But some, some questions in the last few yes, minutes. Yes, sir. Hold on, there's a Microphone coming. Well, I can hear you. <laughs> Hi, Jay. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you very much to both of you as well. This has Thank been great. You. Now, I understand you have a three-wheeled Morgan that came from Ontario, Canada. Right, right. I indirectly know the people who... Mike Beal? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I remember they told me a story that they were sitting in their kitchen having lunch. Yeah. And the dad answered the phone. And he's... Hello? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. I think you have to call England. And then hung up. And the two brothers looked at one another and looked at their dad and said, this guy called and said a wheel had fallen off his Morgan and he was looking for a replacement. Right, right. And, and they said, do you remember who it was? Some, some guy named Jay. <laughs> that was me. Yeah, that was me. Uh, uh, I don't know if you had ever heard the backstory behind it, but they told me at an, uh, yeah, another show. Yeah, we're looking for a wheel. Because, you know, we drive a three-wheel Morgan that has a spare on the back. And we drive there and people go, hey, you lost the wheel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, they, they, hey, you lost the wheel back there. Thank you very much. Good God, is everybody going to do this St. Donald Osborne joke? You know, <laughs> you know, and then finally I pulled up and I realized the wheel had fallen off. <laughs> and I, and it went down in the canyon, and I never, I never got it. But my favorite thing was, was it's a 1946 Morgan three-wheeler. I paid 18.5 for the car back in the 80s. An artist named Cleworth, you know that guy? Mm -hmm. He comes, he says, I'm gonna do a paint, I want to do a painting of your Morgan, fine. He does a painting. I said, how much is the painting? He goes, 25 grand. I said, so I have to sell the car and come up with another 7,500. <laughs> to pay for the painting. To get a picture of the car. Is that what you're telling me? So, yeah, it's, it's, so this is why it's so stupid. Somebody else had a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Some time ago, you said. Thank you. Well, now you can say Some time ago, Jay, you. You, you, uh, you told me that uh, back in the day you were an a apprentice at Rolls Royce. Can you talk about that? Well, not really an apprentice. I just worked at a foreign car dealership. We had Rolls Royce, Mercedes Benz, Bentley, Citroën. Peugeot, Simca, I mean, we were just foreign <laughs> cars. And apprentice is too kind a word for putting <laughs> license plates on. But that's what I did. My favorite thing, when we delivered a, a Corniche convertible in 1970, was $29,500. The price the of the most expensive house. car you could buy, yeah. We drive it to the guy's house, we give him the key, we leave. <laughs> it's in the driveway. <laughs> car burns to the ground. <laughs> Some electrical short, you know. The guy calls up furious, and my boss said, well, you must have been smoking in it. <laughs> because I don't smoke, I didn't get in it. It was just parked there. <laughs> so it was the day of lean carburation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That young man there, you had a question? Yes. yes, sir. I want to tell you first, 
What is that? Sorry. I wanted to tell you, first off, thank you for letting me uh, visit your garage this oh, summer. Oh, sure. It was absolutely fantastic. Cool. You were much smaller then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've grown a lot since then. It's just that uh, of the, all of the cars in your collection, my two, probably my favorite cars in there were your McLaren F1. Right. And your Bugatti Type 57 SC Atlantic. Oh, well, thank I mean, you. Of the two cars... They're both obviously from different eras, but they're right. kind of the supercar of their era. There are obvious differences, but what are the similarities, do you think, between the two? Oh, the similarities. It's like the most intelligent question so far. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> huh? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. Wow. Uh, the similarities, well, they're both rare. Uh, they're both the vision of one person. I, I tend to like automobiles that are one man's vision. I, I say man because women weren't designing cars back then. But usually it's one person's idea. I mean, like when you see Ferraris, you got the, the long thing with the short legs. That's what Italians look like, you know? I mean, it's, 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 that's sort of no, Simeon say, type of... Type. To say Italiano, no? Yeah, right. so, yeah, yeah. But I mean, so that's what I mean. Gordon Murray designed the F1. And he didn't want a radio in the car because it was distracting. So you couldn't get one with a radio. You couldn't get an F1 with a radio. It's the Gonas when he designed the Mini. He said, I don't want people listening to the radios in my car. So you couldn't get a radio. So the dealers would go crazy because <laughs> people make a fortune <laughs> putting so radios right. in them off on, you know, side roads somewhere, that kind of thing. So, so that's probably the fact that they uh, each are probably the most powerful cars of the day, or close to the most powerful, and one person's vision. So that would be the thing that probably ties them together. Let's see. Who else do you have a question? And how old are you, young lady? <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. What's, <laughs> What's your wife drive? What does my wife drive? My wife loves her uh, electric Fiat 500. She thinks that's the greatest car in the world. And, and, you know, and it is. I mean, go to the store, go anywhere, and, you know, and plugging in is not a huge deal. She just plugs in. Every day she has a full tank of electricity, so to speak. And it's pretty bulletproof. I mean, you can lease them for $99 a month. And, However, you have to be careful because the range is longer than the Baker Electric, uh -huh. so she might get away from it. It's about the sound range. Well, that's true. That's true, yeah. But no, that's what she likes. She likes that because it's... I, I mean, I originally got an X, a big Jag XJ, but that was too big and too clunky. What she likes is it's easy to maneuver, and her friends think it's the cutest car ever. And, it's, it, no, it, and they're really fantastic. They're really good cars. Yeah. I have a question over here. Yes. Speaking, speaking of emotion... <clears throat> I was very impressed as a car guy reading your book. And you talked about you had this uh, car that you restored and spent a whole weekend putting the interior in, but it was a convertible and you didn't have a top. No, that's not quite the story. It was a uh, 34 Ford pickup truck. See, this is why innocent men go to prison when you have these kind of eyewitnesses here. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, okay. <laughs> no, no it's, uh, it was a... Uh, <laughs> No, it was a 34 Ford pickup truck, and one of my idiot friends, we had just put a, a, you know, the tuck and roll, I was a high school kid, so it was all, you know, naga hide, we just put the new interior in, and one of my idiot friends had slammed the truck door, and being 1934, it wasn't safety glass, and the glass just shattered. Oh. Uh, so I drive to school, and I park in the parking lot, and it was one of those schools where the windows are here, and the parking lot is there, and I could see the car from... Uh, from, from math class, whatever class I was in. <laughs> and then it starts to rain. And I go, oh, it's raining. I said, no, what am I going to do? And then I actually broke down in tears. I looked out. I see my mom and dad pull up they, with a big tarp. And my mother's out there slipping on the thing, trying to, you know, <laughs> just hilarious, trying to cover the car. Uh, uh, yeah, and it was really, they, they were really wonderful folks. They were really great, great fun. Dad left the office to go, go, go to buy a plastic tarp to put over the car to pick up my mother. Yeah, it was really funny. It was really funny, but I always remember that. So that's the scene, that's the thing you're talking about. In the book. I think it's time for one more question. Sure. Have you always liked cars? Uh, no. <laughs> well, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I, 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 I thought we had made that obvious. Uh, 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 okay. Now, I want to compare that question to the 11-year-old. No no, 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 no. I'm sorry. It was such an easy setup. I, 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 he does you know, when you're comic, you have to take the shot. I'm sorry, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, yes, I always like... 
Well, I, you know, I grew up in rural New, ha New England, which is right near New, uh, Massachusetts, right near New Hampshire. And you just always had to know how to fix things, lawnmowers. My mother didn't know anything about cars, but she knew in her valley when it wouldn't start, if you took the round thing off and stuck a screwdriver to hold that little flap open, the car would probably start. So everybody, every kid sort of, it just, in the way every kid knows computers now, when I was a kid, it was cars. I mean, the music, little GTO, little Deuce Coupe, 409. I mean, nobody sings about cars anymore. It was just, it was just. And nor do they think about computers. Yeah, it was, it was popular culture. <laughs> And it was just something, it was the only way. I mean, now you can go places virtually. I mean, kids sit home now and go, hey, yes, uh, email me a naked picture, fine. In our day, <laughs> you had to drive to the girl's house, make sure the, you know <laughs> make sure the parents weren't there, <laughs> somehow convince her to take a club, take the picture, and then you had to find a drugstore three towns away. <laughs> that didn't know your parents, it would develop the picture. And then when you got the picture back, remember it would have these things, remember it would be a... <laughs> yeah, so, so that was sort of the, that was sort of the, that was the difference. I mean, you know, so you, you needed a car to do stuff. I mean, everything was uptown. Uptown was seven miles. And I'd be on my bike, and I met my friend Louie, who was six months old, that drove by with a girl. Who are you going? I'm going, see you uptown, okay. See you a little bit. You know, I get up town, I'm covered in sweat, everybody's left already. I said, oh, you know, I gotta get a license. This is it. So, so yeah, it's always been interested in cars. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming today. And, well, uh, thanks everybody, thanks you guys. Thanks, thanks. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Donald. Thank you very thank much you, today. Thank you. And uh, I just have to take one second to make a shameless commercial for myself. Oh, yeah, Not that Donald I ever, has ever a fabulous this. book. It's a it's fabulous book. It's a terrific book, book uh, called Stile Transatlantico Transatlantic Style. There are copies for sale in the Retro Auto in the Coach Bill Press booth and an exhibition based on the book at the Blackhawk Museum running until September 30th. Look, this gentleman is a come up here, son. Come here, come here. Look, he's a young Donald Osborne. He has the same tie. <laughs> come, up, come up here. Come up here. Can you come up here okay? You got it? Look at this. Thanks. Look, they're the same guy. <laughs> and cool. one day I will learn to ask in questions as intelligent as he. Yes, Great to see our you two again. young people. What, <laughs> see, there's, there's the hobby. There's the future of the hobby right there. It goes. The, the two best questions are these guys. So, what was your name again? My name is Demetrius Lahiri. Demetrius, okay, and that's. Catch. Catch. Cool. Yes, guys. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you very much. When we're, when we're old, be nice to us. Okay. <laughs> hey, you can go this way. Go down this way. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.